I refuse to create a theology that allows for sickness. The Apostle Paul gives a warning in Galatians, and he says this. He says, if I, and he's the one who brought the gospel to them, he said, if I or even an angel comes to you and preaches to you a different gospel, you're to reject it. All right? What gospel is it? It's the gospel of Jesus. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Paul refers to his thorn in the flesh, which has been interpreted by many as disease allowed or brought on by God. That's a different gospel. I'd like to suggest to you that any interpretation of Scripture that differs from the standard Jesus set needs to be brought into question. Don't approve it. Why? Because the standard is Jesus. And he said in verse 17 of chapter 14, he said, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is God's answer to the sin problem. Peace is God's answer to the, answer to the torment problem. And joy is his answer to the sickness problem. In laughter, laughter is good medicine. And so the kingdom is a, it represents a tri a, a triune healing for the whole person, spirit, soul, and body. In fact, the word evil in the Lord's Prayer, to deliver us from evil, of course, evil refers to sin, but it comes from a word that means pain. And that word comes from a word that means poor. And so we have sin, sickness, and poverty were all dealt with with a redemptive brushstroke of Jesus, the shedding of his blood. Seven places Jesus shed his blood. If you want dominion, you want authority, you want to break the spirit of poverty, sickness, disease, generational curse, and what God really did for you on Calvary, my CDs and teaching, along with Dr. Larry Huggs, five CDs, in-depth teaching with the book that goes in detail about the seven places that Jesus shed his blood to give you victory, which means you're a conqueror, you're an overcomer in all things. Go to the website, write the P.O. box, or call the toll-free number for your ministry gift of $35 or more. To Jesus, number four is Jesus' hands were pierced by the nails to restore total dominion to the works of your hands. Fifth place, Jesus' feet were nailed to the cross to restore total dominion in your walk. Number six, the spear was thrust through Jesus' side, showing that he died from a broken heart to heal my broken Absolutely. heart. And we're going to go there. And number seven, Jesus bled on the inside when he was bruised to break every iniquity, which is those repeated sins of your forefathers. That it's, the, it's really learned behavior. It, it, he, we've never missed our tithe. Tis right. and I have never missed a tithe, never made a pledge and didn't pay it, always gave, but never saw prosperity until I learned the third place that Jesus shed his blood, to break the curse of poverty. Uh, uh, the word redeem means to be brought back. In the Garden of Eden, there was no poverty, there was no hunger, there was no need of food stamps, there was no right. debt. It was a land that flowed with milk and honey. When Adam and Eve disobeyed, they were thrown, and by the way, the word, the word Eden, all of Eden was not a garden. Mm -hmm. The Bible says the garden was the east part of Eden. The word Eden means a place of voluptuous living. Right. God wants his children living voluptuously. I was thorns are a symbol of debt, in Hebrew, of mm -hmm. debt, right. poverty, and lack. Come on, and teach. so here they come with Jesus. Teach. They see the symbol of debt, poverty, and lack. In mocking Jesus, they build a crown out of these thorn bushes. They take that crown and press it into the brow of Jesus. Now, God said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow, Come on, teach. Every, no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you sweat, you're never going to get ahead because I'm not Jehovah Jireh anymore. But here comes Jesus, and they take that, that curse of poverty and lack, press it into the brow of Jesus. We're cursed by the sweat of Adam's brow. Those thorns pierce the brow of our Savior, and the curse of poverty has been broken, and we're reconnected to Jehovah our, our gyra, our provider, by the blood of Jesus Christ. See. That, that said to me that Bill Johnson defines as part and parcel of the gospel this idea of healing. And uh, he said, I don't even allow for a gospel that, uh, that allows for sickness. So coming, uh, coming from somebody wearing glasses. 
Yeah, and the, the way that you define stickness is interesting to me um, in that context. And so what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, number one, uh, I know Bill Johnson uh, not well. I haven't seen him for a long, long time. But when I was a pastor up in Humboldt County, he and others from his church uh, would come over to North County from Reading, which was 100 miles away. And they have a number of uh, churches that re they relate to over there. And they, they related to me. Um, I had a ministry on the campus of Humboldt State. And we would have uh, Chris Felton came in one time. And um, we did a, an outreach on the HSU campus. I had a class, Christianity and the Supernatural. And we prayed for people, and there were some healings, and some, some students were blown away. So I, had, I have a history with them. So I can tell you that um, I can eat the chicken and spit out the bones. At the same time that was going on, I, I heard uh, Chris Valentin teaching on uh, something that sounded extremely like shepherding that I had survived and come through and talked in great depth with him about um, and didn't get very far with that. So I don't know where he is on that right now. So I, I have a history with them and I, I see an enormous amount of, of good that they do. You know, he's uh, standing up against abortion, standing up for biblical values in our culture when many who we, you know, we might consider more, quote, orthodox in, in, in doctrine are doing nothing, waiting for the rapture or they're uh, thinking that they're not supposed to use their stewardship of political voice and vote to make a difference, assault and light in our culture. So I'm saying the body of Christ has a mixture of people with some good and some bad and some ugly you know, and where does it cross the line where you could legitimately say that is a cult group? Uh, I, you know, we need to be really careful because if they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, now where I would take exception of him, I would say someone that doesn't believe that God heals anymore, someone who's a cessationist and who has, who has written off the supernatural, uh, from today, I would say they're they're wrong. <laughs> I wouldn't say that they're preaching a different gospel. John MacArthur is definitely a cessationist, uh, but he's not a cult leader. Uh, he's divisive on the Holy Spirit, but he he preaches what I would consider the true gospel, except for when it comes to the Holy Spirit and certain gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's been very divisive, so, but I wouldn't throw him out as a cult leader anymore, and I would throw Bill Johnson out, who's on the other side of that, as a cult leader. I would say I disagree strongly with some of the things both of them teach, uh, but when it comes to salvation in Jesus Christ and the gospel, uh, you know, you got, a, you got an umbrella under which God has to figure out. Um, you know, who's the perfect one here? Where's the perfect church to join? I think the Mormons have th thought they're the ones, and others think they're the ones. Uh, fact is, until we see Jesus face to face, we won't become like him totally. And so there's a mixture of uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly in with the churches. And uh, so I, I'm... I confront things that I think have heretical issues attached to them um, because the seeds of heresy will grow. And, and uh, if, if people like, like the thing that one of the things that worries me the most today is the love gospel. Oops. Hi, Abby. <laughs> yeah. The love gospel. God is so loving. Everything is love, love, love. And so you take, you take uh, 
what Paul wrote in Corinth, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 9 to 11. He lists all the sins, of catalog of sins, including sexual sins, both heterosexual and homosexual, and all the other things that are on the list. And he said, and such were some of you. He said, I, I warn you as I did as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So those who would say the gospel doesn't have transforming power to set us free from a, a promiscuous, sinful lifestyle, or can't turn us from a, a thief into an honest person, I would say that is a false gospel. And that's a very dangerous false gospel that I see getting more and more traction in the church, that God loves everybody. You know, The Shack, I saw the movie The Shack, and uh, it was a deeply moving movie. And yet when the, the character asked the person playing God the Father, uh, you know, I know about your wrath and all that, and the figure playing God the Father says, what's that? <laughs> you know, heresy. Mm -hmm. Jesus talked about hell and judgment, probably more than he did heaven. And uh, for people to leave out that as part of the gospel, if we're saved, what are we saved from? And... Uh, you know, where John the Baptist, it says, you know, who, you brood of vipers, who warned you to come out of the fire, coming fire? And, and uh, then it's, the Bible says, and with many other words, he preached to them the good news. <laughs> well, part of the good news is that we are facing judgment unless we repent. God loves us all, and he sent his son to show it. And Jesus died for us and rose again, but we need to respond. And the gospel has the power to transform us. And we leave out that transformation. Uh, we have distorted the gospel. So I call that a false gospel. Yeah, it, there's two things about uh, Bill Johnson in that clip that are, are disturbing to me. One is it reminds me of... Uh, because they would come at us saying like, well, how can you say that we're preaching another gospel when you have him tacitly saying anybody who is saying that, uh, you know, sickness is something that God would allow under any circumstances, um, then that, that's another gospel. And it reminds me of uh, Joseph Smith's first vision where mm -hmm. Join none of the churches. They're all an abomination. Their creeds are, you know, atrocity in my sight, you know, all that kind of stuff. But yet, you know, Mormons all the time, you know, why do you, why do you spend your time, you know, focusing on, you know, what, where we're wrong or, you know, why don't you just focus on the gospel? So that, that's one part that concerns me. The other part is Bill Johnson it seems to have this very interesting hermeneutic where he blatantly says, if you find something that you think says something somewhere else in the Bible, other than the gospels, but Jesus didn't say it, but then you find something Jesus said, you have the right to ignore everything else that was said. Yeah, I don't know what he would mean by that. I, in, in the book, uh, reading the Bible for all it's worth. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh, one of the principles of interpretation is we interpret the Old Testament from a New Testament perspective because Christ fulfilled the Old Testament. For example, Colossians 2.16, don't let anyone judge you by Sabbaths, new moons, yes. um, holy days, etc. These are a shadow of what's to come. The substance, the important thing is Christ, relationship with Christ. So I don't, know if, I don't know if that's what he's saying or not. I don't no, know. It, it, it's not, it's not what he's saying. He's saying that uh, in his opinion, 
he would readily admit that he can find things that Paul or Peter or say Moses or whatever um, that would say that in his opinion and in his interpretation of what Jesus has proclaimed as the gospel of the kingdom, that they would be saying something maybe different. And if that's the case, then he says, then um, you have the permit, my permission to ignore every, what everybody else said and go with Jesus. Was he saying if you interpret it as saying something different or if well, it I actually it, is different? Well, I think that the problem is that he's interpreting what Jesus said mm -hmm. as something, something specific right. and agreeing with all of these new apostolic theological uh -huh. distinctives. And he's basically, his hermeneutic is just completely centered. This is what the gospel of the kingdom is. And that is the gospel, and there's no other gospel. And so it's a, a very myopic view that's getting people, I feel like getting them ultimately to get out of the Bible and focus their attention on what God's doing now, what God's saying through me right now, the apostle, the prophet, you know, that this is God's word right now for today. Yeah, I would, I would doubt very seriously that you would ever find Bill Johnson saying, forget the Bible and listen to me. I, I've never heard him say anything. I've heard him misinterpret, in my mind, misinterpreting the Bible, um, like the, you know, the apostolic uh, anointing and so forth. I've heard uh, misinterpretations. I've heard things that I strongly disagree with. I think Bill Johnson is a, he's not someone who tends to be a confrontive person. Uh, under the umbrella of his leadership, he allows a lot of things to happen and be said that I, I wouldn't feel comfortable at all with. But as far as him personally, um, I've heard him say, things that I definitely don't agree with, misinterpreting it in my mind, you know, using the explicit, implicit speculation test. I think I'd have a lot of issues with a lot of things he and others say uh, from there. Uh, but I, I don't, I've never heard anything from Bill Johnson that would point to himself instead of Christ and the word as the final authority. I, I've never heard that. If, if that's happening, that's, that's very worrisome to me. I would yeah. Say. Something I wanted to kind of revisit for a second, that healing and the atonement doctrine that he was teaching, that um, part of the gospel is that you're going to be healed. Um, see, that was, that was something that was not explicitly taught in the congregation I was a part of, but it was it – was, um, Implicit? It was implicit in the sense that it was pretty much taught, just not as plain and clear. Mm -hmm. Now, what he did just now, what Johnson just did when he, he spoke that to his congregation, is uh, he just sent at least 75% of his entire congregation of people in a tailspin as they are now questioning their salvation. because, And, and that might be a, a, a very conservative estimate. You you gotta assume almost every person in that room has health issues. You know what I'm I, saying? And I, I don't think he would be saying that uh, people that have health issues aren't saved. I think what he would say is people that say God doesn't heal anymore are preaching a different gospel. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the, because, the, I mean, Bill, the moment. Bill, but. Bill Johnson, I heard him teach on his father, who was a, a charismatic pastor before him at Bethel, um, actually got cancer and died of cancer after Bill had prayed and the church had prayed through the entire process, wholeheartedly believing in healing, and his father died, 
Um, and someone asked Bill, what do you learn from that? I, I'm sure he would see an element of mystery in that. He said, well, let me put it this way. If before, let's see, I tried to move a thousand pound rock through prayer and I failed. Uh, but now I can move a 500 pound rock. I mean, I think he's saying the battle helped him grow in faith. Um, but they make it clear not everyone is healed that they pray for. I think I think what they're concerned about is cessationists that say God doesn't do this anymore, or um, you know I think he's reacting at that. I think it's overstating it to, to say what he said. I think you know Jesus said, "As to your faith, let it be done for you." There is an element of faith. I think under the umbrella of faith, there are different kinds of approaches to God in faith. And I, I want to be careful not to judge anybody's sincere approach to faith uh, when they're praying. I, I, I had a dear friend, 84 years old. She got cancer. And some, uh, someone I would call a charismaniac, someone I would call, forgive me, Lord, shouldn't be little people, but would you know call someone who's you know it's your fault she she said you know why you have cancer don't you because you don't have enough faith to be healed well this 84 year old woman was a mature enough christian she said you know i don't i don't believe that and she went to the lord and said lord i know you can heal me and i don't want to die right now i ask you to heal me but if you want to take me home i'm ready she was healed. <laughs> then you've got Dodie Osteen, Joel's mother, who had two weeks to live, they said, and she was down to the wire. And she just kept claiming the scriptures, claiming the scriptures, claiming the promises. And God healed her. Then you've got people that just yell, help, God, help me. I need help. And God heals some of them, just like he heals some of the others. And like he doesn't heal in each of those categories. I, I knew a woman in West Virginia who, wonderful woman, but she was in the faith, word of faith movement, and she got breast cancer. She didn't want to go to the doctor. She just stood on it, stood on it, stood on it. She died. Knew another woman wanted a baby. I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. She didn't get pregnant. Um, so what I'm hearing yeah. is it's, it's, it's God's sovereign will. It's God's yes. choice to heal. And, and I totally agree with that. 100%. Yeah. And I don't want to put God in a box. He can no. heal anytime he wants to. That's he can right. raise the dead if he wants to. That's right. Um, and, he, and, and people approach God differently. Mm -hmm. And, and, Reading the promises, by his stripes were healed. Matthew chapter 8, I think it's 17, where it, Jesus healed everybody. This was to fulfill the prophecy in Isaiah, you know, that uh, by his stripes were healed. He took our infirmities, carried our diseases. Any and all of those things, anything, you know, those things that incite faith. Jesus healed everybody that, uh, you know, uh, that came to him at, at certain times. He healed all of it. And you, you see the healing in the New Testament. I don't see any compelling reason to tell people Jesus doesn't heal anymore. The, the only reason that people would say that is they don't see it happening around them. And so, but for people, I, I, who would you rather have pray for you if you have a terminal illness? Someone that believes that God can do anything and says, be healed in the name of Jesus, or someone that doesn't think he can do it. I right. tell you who I would prefer. Right. No, I, I agree. I agree. I, I, um, having said that, yeah, I, I, as you were talking, I just wanted to see what Bill Johnson would say, because I know I've said, I've seen a lot of quotes from him that um, he, he does seem to push this back on the people, as in, if you're not healed, it's your fault. 
I, uh, I've never heard him say that. Here's here's something I just found in just a just a quick little Google. This is his own website. This is uh, bjm.org. It's Bill Johnson Ministries website. Uh -huh. But he uh, the article is is it uh, title is is it always God's will to heal somebody? He says, how can God choose not to heal someone when he already purchased their healing? Was his blood enough for all sin, or just certain sins? Were the stripes he bore only for certain illnesses or certain seasons of time? When, we, when he bore stripes in his body, he made a payment for our miracle. He already decided to heal. You can't decide not to buy something after you've already bought it. And he says, there are no deficiencies on his end. Neither the covenant is deficient, nor his compassion or prom promises. All lack is on our end of the equation. Yeah, that's, see, that's where, I, where I would uh, not not state it the way he did, I, I there's there's such an element of mystery when it comes to healing. Well, yeah, yeah, I, and, and yeah. faith plays a, a role in that. There's an element of mystery. Jesus healed, the early church healed. Jesus commanded his followers to pray for healing. And the gifts of the Spirit include healing. So I think we're supposed to pray for healing. And the James yeah. 5, 16, step out in faith, with all the faith you can muster, and leave the results to God and realize yes. there's a mystery to this. And uh, we don't need to judge each other. Uh, there's a mystery. Yeah, yeah. I was just, I, I totally agree with, with uh, healing and doing it with all the faith you got uh, right. because God can part the Red Sea. He can do right. amazing things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was just commenting to uh, the, the teaching that Bill is, is pushing forth here that puts condemnation and makes people question their salvation when they don't get healed. And that's what happened in my church. And that's why I'm stuck mm -hmm. on this. And I can't get yeah, back. I, I, uh, like I said, his own father, who believed in healing and he believes in healing his own father died and there are many others that go there for healing and don't get healed yeah so he's he's uh he, he doesn't want his theology his expectancy to be shaken by that but i i where i leave a little more room for mystery than he does i don't know well, right. I mean, people like Paul, that was a powerhouse of faith. And yeah. he's praying for this thorn in his flesh, whatever that was. I don't know, an eye ail ailment. I don't know. But he's praying for it over and over, and he wasn't healed. And who was it he left ill? Uh, well, there was, yeah, I think that was Barnabas. Jesus or somebody. It was Timothy. So, I mean, that, even there's a mystery there. We know that God used him to heal. Was it a Trophimus? That sounds about right, yeah. Trophimus, sick in Miletus. Yeah, God, God used him to heal, and yet not everyone was healed. These healings are kind of an invasion of the kingdom coming and the will, you know, the power of God pointing to, to the reality of the kingdom of God that we're going to experience someday in its fullness. 